Welcome to Gideon's Promise, the podcast with Jonathan Rapping. In the landmark 1963 decision Gideon v. Wainwright, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously ruled every person accused of a crime in America must be provided a lawyer, regardless of their ability to pay. This podcast is about the people that uphold that promise, public defenders. These dedicated lawyers give voice to 80% of the people thrown into the system. And yet, in the national discussion regarding justice reform, public defenders are largely overlooked. This show centers public defenders in that conversation. We will explore the critical role public defenders play in addressing a wide range of issues facing marginalized communities with subject matter experts, key opinion leaders, and people impacted by the American criminal legal system. Listen as a community of advocates discuss their work to strengthen public defenders and transform public defense. We typically speak with public defenders and other members of the legal and social justice community, but today we are joined by the voice of the community. Today's special guest is a radio presenter, television personality, and author. He is a co-host of the nationally syndicated radio show, The Breakfast Club, with DJ Envy and Angela Yee, all whom were inducted in the Radio Hall of Fame last year in 2020 for their work on their show. Gideon's Promise is excited to introduce and welcome Charlemagne the God we are so appreciative that you are here to speak with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Illy. Thank you for having me, Rap. How are y'all? Yeah, we're doing great. We're doing great. So before Illy throws the first question your way, I just want to echo that you are an incredibly special guest. I mean, you really represent the essence of what Gideon's Promise is about, what our public defenders work so hard to support, and that's community. And, and I think, you know, now after the past 11 months, America's finally awakened to the fact that black and brown communities um, are vi visited by violence from police regularly. But, but I think what, what we're trying to get out is that that violence that happens in the streets is connected to a violence that happens in the court system, a violence that happens when people survive police encounters, a violence that is routine, it's normalized, it's often invisible, and it's a violence that fuels mass incarceration and destroys the communities that you speak for. And really, public defenders, when they're doing the work right, they are the force needed to interrupt that violence. But the communities need to have compassionate, well-trained, well-resourced public defenders. And what Gideon's Promise is really about, Charlemagne, is building public defenders that are in alliance with communities so communities feel like they have the warriors they need when they enter that system that's crushing them. Um, Illy? So, so Charlamagne, I know on your show you've had a ton of guests, right? You know, I listened and watched and, you know, we saw a lot. We witnessed things that happened. We participated in some of the social justice movements, the protests. But what were some of the takeaways that you experienced, the takeaways that you got last year in 2020 um, in terms of how black and brown communities were treated in 2020? What were some of your takeaways? Some of my takeaways were that the, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, um, I keep wondering if this is a civil rights issue or a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. And it takes me back to, you know, the day when they didn't even label us a whole human, like when we were three fifths of a human, because in my mind, they can never respect our civil rights if they don't even respect us as human beings. And, you know, even you say last year, but I mean, just this in, in the first few weeks of January, we've seen, a young girl gets slammed on her head. A 12-year-old girl gets slammed on her head by police in Florida. You've seen a nine-year-old black girl get handcuffed and tased, you know, by police officers in Rochester. And this is a woman who was a, a young girl. I said a woman, a young girl, nine mm -hmm. years old, who was clearly dealing with some type of mental health issues. She was clearly having some type of manic episode, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and you hear her screaming for her father and you hear them saying, oh, she wanted to commit suicide and she wanted to kill her mom. Clearly something was wrong there. So I just often wonder, you know, why don't they look at us just as people? 
right? Yeah. When you're talking about law enforcement, it's like, I know you got a badge and I know you got a uniform, but you're still a human being. You still got a heart. You still got a soul. I know that you have women in your life that you love, people in your life that you love. So whatever happened to that golden rule we learned in kindergarten? You know? Yeah, yeah. You want the others that you would have them do one to you. Like, so for me, I just realized, man, that, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I don't even know if they've ever really truly changed. What? So what about like what happened? So we talked about the nine year old, Not you know, I just saw the steel shots of what was happening with her. We talk about the 12 year old. If once they survive and I'm going to say this, survive a police encounter. Right. They then potentially get thrown into the courts, thrown into the system. And they have public defenders who have to tell that story that you just said. That little girl obviously had some mental health challenges. She was having a breakdown. What do you think the role is for the lawyer, the court appointed lawyer for that child or even that adult that has issues? What do you think their primary job should be or what they should do? Man, I mean, the primary job of anybody in that judicial system should be to make the judicial system fair and just for everybody. Like, you know, for me, it's never just about getting getting one person off. You know what I mean? Because nine times out of ten, that one person is getting off for something that they shouldn't even be on for. You know, when I looked at all the pardons that Donald Trump did, you know, a few weeks ago, and I'm and, and I, I read a lot. I read majority of them and I'm reading all of these people like doing these f- big football numbers of life sentences for marijuana. When marijuana is, 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 is legal, whether recreationally or, or for medicinal purposes, damn near throughout the majority of the country. And you got an administration that's talking about decriminalizing marijuana now. But yet you're still going to have all of these brothers and sisters locked in jail for marijuana after decriminalizing it like that, that within itself is criminal. So for me, my, I think the job of a public defender or a lawyer is bigger than just getting somebody off, man. It's about how can we change this, this system so it's fair and just for everybody. So I have to say, Charlamagne, I, I, I so appreciate that perspective because I think so much of what we are teaching at Gideon's Promise is that it's not enough to see your role as representing one person in one case, in one instance, but that collectively public defenders are responsible for giving voice to 80% of the people in the system. And and these are people who have been rendered voiceless. And when you see someone as less than human, it's easy to do cruel, inhumane things to them. And so I think public defenders have an obligation to make the system see the human being. They are the conscience of the system. And I, I wonder, Charlemagne, I mean, again, you are so connected to the communities that public defenders serve. What is it that you think we can do at Gideon's Promise to help communities see public defenders as, as allies, to help reformers see investing in public defenders to be the organizations communities need in that system? What can we do to help push public defenders on to the radar so they can have the support to be the advocates communities need. Well, you, you might need to school me on this because in my mind, public defenders aren't the people that you call when you facing like some real serious charges. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's almost like, you know, I was, I grew up sadly, you know, I, I, I did have a bunch of charges, assault and bragging with intent to kill, point and present the firearm, distribution of cocaine, distribution of marijuana. There was, Never a time where somebody was like, yo, get you a public defender. You know, my dad was like, you got to get a lawyer. You got to go right. get the top lawyer in, the, in, the, in our little small town. Like nobody, you like go, being with a public defender was almost considered like, oh, you want to go to jail. Right? Mm. You know what I mean? So I, y'all would have to school me on the cases that public defenders have won that are that are so-called big cases. You know, the times mm. where people were facing like real jail time and public defenders got them off. I think those stories need to be told more often, you know, because I just think it's a narrative that public defenders are for people who can't afford actual legal representation as opposed to no public defenders are legal representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so no, I think you're so right. And I think that, that certainly communities Um, have distrusted public defenders because public defenders have been overworked, they've been overwhelmed, they've been forced to fight with two hands behind their back, and oftentimes they can't give people the representation they deserve. And I think as we're now thinking about as a nation, 
developing a strategy, a comprehensive strategy to make sure that people without means are treated like human beings and get justice? Uh, are there ways that we can rally support for public defenders so that they can be the lawyers those communities need, so that they aren't the kinds of lawyers that make communities say, I need a real lawyer, mm -hmm. right? How do we get how do we get reformers, politicians, celebrities to say we better invest in public defenders because underserved communities deserve better? Yeah, I think it's really just a matter of public defenders being able to tell their own stories, like a narrative. There has to be a narrative change, you know, like if if because all it takes is one. Right. Like if there was like one big story where you mm -hmm. heard about a public defender, you know, getting somebody off you know, for, for something. That changes everything. We're a visual people. All we need is one. Like, we're the guys... I, I still play Powerball every week. <laughs> hey, you never you know. <laughs> if there's a one in something chance, I feel like I can be that one. So if you just show me one time where a public defender actually got somebody off from a major case, that changes the narratives about public defenders, I, I, I believe. You know, it's interesting you say that because, you know, my dad spent 10 years in Attica. The reason I got into this work, I, we didn't trust public defenders. Just like you said, you know, growing up, if they said, you know, the last thing we would do is get a public defender, but we couldn't afford it. And it was really being introduced to rap and a bunch of public defenders in D.C. and then down here in the South who I found out really cared about their clients and really worked hard. And what we experienced growing up was it was really not the intention that public defender was growing up professionally in a system that taught him the process. So I, I totally agree with you when you say it's the exposure is telling that one story because if someone would have told someone would have told me 25 years from my future that I would be running an organization that trains public defenders and transforming criminal justice, I would have been like, you're crazy. You're crazy. That's right. Mm -hmm. hey, hey, I'll say this. If we could get that one story on the Breakfast Club, everybody would know about it. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm, I'm down for that. I'm down for that all day. Like, I, I, I love that because, I, you know, like I said, I even I have a, a perception of, of public defenders. Like, you know, what do they do? And I think a lot of people think public defenders actually work for the judicial system. Like, they're not there for the mm. client. People think public defenders and the judges are all in cahoots with together. The public defenders and the police department is all in cahoots together. Like, as soon as you hear them say, if you can't afford an attorney, we will appoint one for you. Like, in, in any other business, that's a conflict of interest. That's a good you point. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in any other business, that's a conflict of interest. Like, even now, you know, as a businessman, when I'm doing certain deals with people, I'm still a talent, so I might be an aide. I'm, I'm, I'm signed to an agency or I have an attorney. Sometimes I got to sign conflict of waiver, you know, contracts because the, the person I may be partnering with, that's a talent. Me and them might be with the same attorney or be with the same agency. So I have to sign conflict of waiver. So, yeah, I think that a lot of times people think public defenders work for the same system that's, that's oppressing us. So that, that narrative has to change. Yeah, no, well, I think that's right. And I think that for it to change, public defenders have to earn it, right? There are some places in the country where public defenders have earned reputations for being good advocates for communities, but they're few and far between oftentimes. And public defenders need to earn it. And I think to earn it, they have to have the training, the support, the mindset, the resources to do the work the communities need. So we're really honored that you would take time to to, to talk with us. Um, I look forward to continuing to talk with you uh, about how we can help get word out there. And I just want to say one last thing before I give it to you, Illy, to wrap up. Um, we know how busy you are, man. You're interviewing everyone. I just watched an interview you did with Barack Obama. And the <laughs> fact that you would talk with us. To little old us. <laughs> well, well, and, and what that means to our public defenders, hundreds of public defenders across the country who are watching injustice every day and what that does to them, the toll it takes on them emotionally, they need an uplift, man. And, and you being here is an uplift. So I appreciate that. Nah, that's important, rap. And I mean, first of all, there's nothing little about y'all because, like you said, this is about community. You know what I mean? All of us are intertwined. All of us are connected. In order for us to be what we say we want to be as a society, we all got to have this kind of synergy. 
Like anything that can benefit the greater good of the community, I'm always going to be down for. Well, I appreciate that. And, and that just leads me to the final thoughts. Um, it truly takes a village, right? It takes a village to do the work that we're doing to amplify our voices, black and brown communities across this country. I want to thank you so much for joining us today and, and helping us make, I guess, current history, but black history. Um, it is Black History Month in February. So I truly, truly appreciate you taking time with us today. Illy, rap, thank you. And I look forward to, you know, hearing that story on The Breakfast Club so we can, you know, start painting public defenders in a better light. Let, let's I'm going to get you that story. I'm, that's what I do. I'm going to get you that story. Thank you all very right. much. All right, all right. Take care. Oh, it was so great having Charlemagne join us. And our next guest, as Charlemagne said, it takes a village. Our next guest is part of the Gideon's Promise Village. We are joined by Tiffany Williams Roberts, who is with the Southern Center for Human Rights as the Community Engagement and Movement Building Council. Tiffany is a civil rights and criminal defense attorney in Atlanta, Georgia. She was a public defender for the Atlanta Judicial Circuit, which is here, Atlanta, Georgia, Fulton County. And most importantly for us, was a member of the Gideon's Promise class of 20... 2009, best class ever. 2009. So we would like to give a warm Gideon's Promise podcast. Welcome to Tiffany Williams Roberts. Yes, Thanks. welcome, Tiffany. I'm excited. So Tiffany, we're here. Um, as you know, we this is our second year doing this podcast. We heard some great commentary um, just a few minutes ago from Charlemagne the God. And, and, and one of the big questions that has been on the table are why are public defenders so critical in this fight for racial and economic justice? Listen, I always ask, where is the public defender's office whenever I'm in a room purporting to support the needs of people who are in the criminal legal system? Because what I know from being a public defender is that I was the person closest to the issue plaguing them and my client base as a whole. So I believe that public defenders, especially when they are, are, um, are supported and engaged, have the most to share about the the ways that our systems really harm people coming from marginalized communities. Uh, and they are one voice that, that our clients have um, when they can't be heard other places. And so I think public defenders can be friends and confidants and supporters of the people most harmed by the criminal legal system. And so they are absolutely necessary um, when we're talking about any changes that we want to see. Tiffany, let me, let me actually piggyback off of that before I get to the second question, because you obviously spent time as a public defender. You now are incredibly active as an organizer, as a movement builder um, in the Atlanta community. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how your work as a public defender sort of contributed to and helped um, help, helped you sort of become the organizer that you are, helps inform the work you do. Yeah, so my career as a public defender is actually directly linked to my organizing history in Atlanta. When I was at the public defender's office, uh, myself and two other Gideon's Promise public defenders, Anna Kirian and Jessica Stern, became a part of a fledgling local organization called Building Locally to Organize for Community Safety. And we joined the organization because there was a, um, a push by white residents in the city to criminalize Black boys specifically and link them to street gangs because there had been a murder in Grant Park. And so um, through blocks, we started trying to figure out how can we protect our community alongside organizers and residents and grandparents and parents in ways that we weren't able to do um, in the courtroom. And uh, what we found is that in the same way that we were resources to, to the community and the community organizations because of our jobs, they were resources to us in finding better ways to support our clients. And so my organizing never stopped. I left the public defender's office actually so that I could organize more. And um, in my capacity at Southern Center, what I do is build relationships between all of, the, all of those different groups between organizations, lawmakers, faith-led um, organizations, and anybody else who's interested in forward progress. But I don't think I would have been able to do that 
if I had not first been at the Fulton County Public Defender's Office with some other amazing organizers who also happen to be Gideon's Promise attorneys. So with all of the the on the ground grassroots work you do, which is primary, primarily your responsibility at the Southern Center, how do you get the communities that you work with to trust the public defender office? How do you make that connection for them? What is your strategy behind that? Most of the time, I just say, let's just get them in the room, or I guess during COVID, let's put them on a call, right? Let's give them a Zoom invitation. Give them an opportunity to share what they know. A prime example is with the protester arrests um, from this summer, uh, when attorneys were trying to get together and figure out how to represent these folks pro bono, you know, some of us knew that there was no way to do that without having conversations with people from the public defender's office. And so right now we meet weekly, but we've been doing that since the summer. And our first couple of meetings were public defender's offices coming on, talking about the way that their courtrooms work um, and making recommendations about how we can be supportive and not harmful. And so I think, you know, relationships are at the heart of everything the organizers do. And so without helping the community to have relationships with offices and individuals within the public defender's office, you're not able to to build trust. And the other thing I do is talk about their trial records. You know, um, too often organizations will hire private counsel just assuming that the private attorney is going to do a better job. And I'll say, well, have you heard about my friend so-and-so? This is how many not guilty she's got. Have you heard about my friend so-and-so? He filed 50 speedies in one week, right? Like it's important for us to introduce folks to one another so that they can build relationships. Yeah, so Tiffany, uh, you know, we have all been watching this criminal legal reform movement that's been going on for the past several years. Thanks to authors like Michelle Alexander um, and her book, The New Jim Crow, as a nation, we kind of have awakened to um, the, 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 the tragedy that is mass incarceration. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation around how we address that, that problem. And, and even people who might be unlikely allies are, are now starting to think about how we deal with what has become a crisis in our nation, a crisis to our democracy. Um, but yet, you know, as we follow these conversations over the last several years, and even today, public defenders are frequently not a part of those conversations. As someone who sort of understands intimately why public defenders need to be part of those conversations, why, why do you think they've been left out, ignored? I think one of the reasons they've been left out is because they've been systemically deprived of the resources um, that they need to do their jobs in the way that they want to public defender's office over time. Um, really, public services, except for police, have been just deprived of resources decade after decade after decade. And then there's also this narrative that private attorneys are real attorneys and public defenders are public pretenders. And, you know, we all know that we we. Uh, confront that in the courtroom, um, and we are constantly proving ourselves to clients. Whenever you, you know, whenever you're not being paid for something, folks assume that you're receiving an inferior service. But I also think that there's something to um, the tendency to uh, prop up prosecutors and then diminish public defenders because the purpose of the criminal legal system is to punish, and the people who make it more difficult to punish people in the criminal legal system is uh, our public defenders. And so why would a system intended to punish our clients elevate our voices without us demanding it and agitating um, to get it? And so that's really, I just think it's like a combination of those things, the way that we've been deprived of resources, the way that the narrative has been framed to pit public defenders almost against their own clients, and then this insistence on propping up prosecutors as being the only noble job that one can do in public service in the criminal legal system. So Tiffany, how do, one thing Charlemagne said was the, the notion that public defenders aren't real lawyers. Like so much we even talked about getting a shirt that says I am a real lawyer for all of our public defenders. And when you talked about the, the community and the push to put, you know, public defenders against the community based on this external narrative, how do we get the community's public defenders serve to know and understand that num these, number one, these are real lawyers, <laughs> right? And these are lawyers who are fighting and advocating 
on their behalf? Like what, what tangible thing can offices do or public defenders do to, to make that a reality so we can get away from that negative connotation, if you will? I think offices need to be in the community. I know it's sort of like a sticky situation for some of my peers who say, how can I be in court eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours a day, and then you want me to go table on a Saturday, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that there has to be some visibility for the the humans that work in public defender's office um, in those communities. I think, you know, of course, Gideon's Army and other... um, Uh, documentaries and public appearances by leaders or national leaders on this, like you all, it's important. But for example, every public defender's office has supervisors who don't litigate. You know, Mm -hmm. every public defender's office have other staff who are not stuck in court all day. And I think it's important to look at places like Knoxville, to look at places like Harlem, where um, folks are in community building and not to confuse the role of the public defender's office to be a soup kitchen or some other service provider, because I think that's a very dangerous thing to do because Mm -hmm. it can empower prosecutors to say, well, let's just pump people into programs. Don't work on acquittals. Don't work on dismissals. Just like feed them. Right. But we also need um, to get to know the communities that we serve. I think that's with all social services that distrust and, and contempt often comes from unfamiliarity. Uh, that's insightful. I couldn't agree more. Um, you, you know, Tiffany, I also, I mean, I, I know you as um, a lawyer who is incredibly respected for her skill in the courtroom. You've, you've been involved in some really important cases. Uh, I also know you as a tenacious advocate in the streets uh, where there are people organizing in and around Atlanta, you are there. Um, Your name is known in legal circles and non-legal circles. And I think, um, you know, I mean, I I, I really do believe there is a strong connection between the violence that is visited upon black and brown communities in the streets and the violence that is visited upon them in the courtrooms when they survive police encounters. And I think right now as a nation, we really are focused on, rightfully so, um, the the real serious police violence happening to Black and Brown communities. I, I'm not sure that the more invisible routine violence happening in courtrooms every day is necessarily on our radars as much. And I wonder, are there things you think that we can do? Gideon's promise, people who care about racial justice, economic justice, but also have great love for public defenders and the role they play in that space that is the courtroom. Are there things we can do to help make that connection more clearly? I think um, continuing to partner with community organizations to engage in political education is really important. Right now you have a captive audience because people can't go to, you know, community centers as often as they would because of COVID, but there are so many opportunities for people to learn online. And I, um, I, we always try to stress that like state violence exists on a continuum all the way from interacting with community in the streets to the violence of the death penalty or state sanctioned murder. And we have, but the, the in between, the people who do not die are the ones who are most, um, that, that's where your numbers are going to be. The people who are um, sentenced to life imprisonment, uh, people who are sentenced to die, um, people who are, in sentence to, who are sentenced to life equivalent sentences, like they might as well have a life sentence because of how long they're going to end. The children who are robbed of their childhood by the criminal legal system, those people are invisibilized in a lot of ways and they're made the boogeyman. They are the people that we're taught to be so afraid of that they don't deserve services and care. And I think that um, when we're talking about even uh, the defund the police movement, People are so offended uh, by what Movement for Black Lives is doing, which, by the way, is something that organizations have done for decades um, by saying money belongs in care and services and not in ballooning militarized police budgets. And so I think political education, critical partnerships, I think about um, partnerships with uh you, you all have hosted a Dinner for Law for Black Lives, which is a political home for attorneys who kind of live in that in-between space, uh, partnering with uh, nonprofit law firms like Southern Center, like Arch City Defenders. Arch City Defenders out of St. Louis have such a 
powerful um, political education campaign, both on social media and in their in-person events. Uh, and there are probably so many others, Asada's Daughters in Chicago. There are um, so many organizations that are um, committed to multi-pronged ways to um, impact positively the lives of Black folks and marginalized folks in the country. And I think we're acknowledging that the criminal legal system is just one piece of that, but it is a critical piece because it is the piece that robs, uh, like basically kidnaps swaths of folks from their communities for decades upon decades and are so dismissed as being unimportant. It's so interesting you said that about uh, other organizations who are in the space, right? They might not be lawyers, but they're doing community work. And that was also mentioned in our earlier interview is we, we're all uh, we're all in this together, right? And oftentimes we're working in silos. And, and so this whole aspect of a village, once again, the community aspect working together for the greater good and for people who are often marginalized and without a voice. So I, I appreciate giving, you giving examples of organizations that are out there. People are always looking, what can I do to help, right? I'm not a lawyer. What can I do to help? So thank you for that, Tiffany. And my, our last question to you, and this time is going by so quickly, um, is you went through Gideon's Promise, and I would be remiss if I don't ask the GP question as the executive director of the organization. What does GP, Gideon's Promise, bring to this space, to this work that makes it so unique? What is unique about your experience with Gideon's Promise and your continued work with the organization post your time with us? Without Gideon's Promise, I wouldn't have made it two and a half years as a public defender. And I and I, I acknowledge that's such a small amount of time just because my love was organizing. And um, But without Gideon's Promise, there are so many of us who would not be able to stay in the fight. And what it does, in addition to skills training, you can get skills training a lot of places, right? You can get skills training anywhere. But the, but the, the thing that Gideon's Promise offers is an opportunity to feel that you are part of something bigger, not because you're a part of an organization, but because the politic of Gideon's Promise supports um, wrapping our arms around the community that is most harmed by this criminal legal system and including us lawyers in that community, not distancing ourselves. So, so often lawyers are taught to distance ourselves from our clients to distance ourselves from our coworkers, right? To distance ourselves from the trauma instead of figuring out how to work through all of the difficulties of what we experience, mm -hmm. lives that we're in it together. So it's like you go to the summer meeting and then you feel like you're depleted and here comes the winter meeting, right? And you mm -hmm. feel like you're depleted and, and it, it cannot be overstated the importance of like the humanity sort of woven through everything that Gideon's Promise does. And I always, I, even when teaching, I use a lot of our drills from Gideon's Promise with my students mm -hmm. because I learned so much about how to treat this experience in an unconventional way to be more than just a lawyer. You know, I'm a person, I'm a mom, I'm a daughter, um, I'm the sister of people who have been impacted by the system. So how do I bring all of that and acknowledge all of that in the client? Yes. You know, before before we wrap up, I, I'd be remiss not to point out we're talking about a village, community, family. Tiffany, uh, as a as a relatively new public defender, joined the Gideon's Promise family. But we were launched as a program of the Southern Center for Human Rights, where you are now, Tiffany. The Southern Center is an organization we love dearly. It is part of our family. So this is special. It's really special to have you here repping Gideon's Promise, repping the Southern Center for Human Rights, and making this connection between that community work and the work in the legal system. Um, really special. So, so thank you for joining us, Tiffany. Thank you for having me. We love y'all too. Well, thank you, Tiffany. Um, and in true former fashion, as we close out every podcast, this is Ilham Askia. And I'm Jonathan Rapping. Rapping it, it up. up. <laughs> hey, Il, before we hit that outro, why don't you tell people how to order a copy of the book in your radio voice? In my radio voice? Yeah, in your okay. radio voice. Okay. Get your copy of Gideon's Promise, A Public Defender Movement to Transform Criminal Justice at Amazon, IndieBound, Beacon Press, or wherever books are sold. Pre-order today and a portion of proceeds 
will help us support public defenders. Oh, that was good. That was good. (laughs) Thank you for listening to Gideon's Promise, the podcast with Jonathan Rapping. For more information on the topics covered and featured guests, please visit our website at gideonspromise.org. And finally, please subscribe, share, and let us know what you think.